So today I'm going to take you through our current exhibition, Leaders and Masses, Mega Paintings from Soviet Ukraine. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about the background of these paintings and how they arrived uh, in our museum. Uh, these paintings currently on display are a gift from um, Rose Brady uh, from the collection of the Brady and Manichuk, Yuri Manichuk, you see him on the screen right now, his portrait. Uh, he was the person who put together this collection in the 1990s. Uh, Yuri uh, was born in Lviv in Ukraine. Uh, he became an American citizen in the late 80s. Um, he is, uh, became in the 90s the legal advisor for the Ukrainian government on behalf of the World Bank. And he traveled to Ukraine. And in mid 90s, uh, he amassed this wonderful collection of Soviet era paintings from the 1950s uh, to 1980s. Uh, he passed away in 2009. Eight, Rose uh, could correct me. Uh, so our donor Rose Brady is with us today and I want to thank her for this remarkable gift to our museum. Uh, I listened to an interview that Yuri gave uh, a while ago and uh, he said that his idea behind collecting these paintings was of course, uh, you know, going back to his past years in the Soviet Union, but also recreating an exhibition, uh, an official Soviet exhibition, the way it would be if it was mounted on an important occasion, like the revolution anniversary, or um, I don't know, 40 years of the Red Army, something like this. So these Soviet exhibitions were uh, usually composed or structured in a certain way. They were supposed to represent all the major Soviet genre of paintings, uh, such as uh, the top uh, uh, genre or the top kind of painting in the Soviet hierarchy of paintings was the, uh, a large thematic painting, as it was called, on historical and revolutionary themes representing um, the revolution, civil war, world war II, Soviet leaders. Usually they were multi-figure compositions that uh, included a lot of people. Also some uh, uh, working people and collective farmers as well would be part of that genre. Then there would be individual portraits, uh, still lives and landscapes. Uh, which would be considered a minor genre, but not an excluded from a large official Soviet era censored exhibition. And uh, so when I looked at these paintings and began to, I wanted to display them right away. We received this uh, donation very recently. Actually, the last 15 paintings out of 111 came last week. So it's a very recent donation, but the paintings are so remarkable in how large they are, how they represent the official Soviet art and the, ma the major style, which is socialist realist art, that I wanted to show them right away. And um, we had an opening in our main gallery and the mezzanine gallery, and we are showing about uh, 36, 37 paintings uh, from this collection. So when I looked at them and thought about the theme or the angle that this exhibition would take, uh, this, uh, the title Leaders and the Masses came right away because what I saw uh, in these paintings, a lot of leaders, Soviet leaders, Lenin, Stalin, Khrushchev, even Brezhnev in one painting, and um, also a lot of working people, a lot of large paintings with workers, fishermen, peasants. And um, uh, so leaders and the masses. Humanity has always been puzzled by who or what makes history. Is it leaders or working people, working masses? Is it heroes or the people, the nation as a whole, or probably divine intervention? 
well, the Soviet uh, art and generally uh, the Soviet ideology gave an answer to that. And this answer was Marxist, Marxist. So we see a lot of Marxist ideology behind these paintings. They seem so different, but there is an underlying concept under all of them. So let's now walk into the gallery and see some of the paintings. I will be showing you gallery view, views, you know, gallery shots, and uh, some close-ups of some paintings. So this is how our exhibition starts. It's really stunning in how large these paintings are. We have never shown anything like this before. No, we didn't have this kind of paintings. Very large, very Soviet, very socialist, realist reflecting the historical moment of uh, in the history of world art as it was reflected in the Soviet Union. Um, and um, so the first painting we are going to look at is this. This painting is called Lenin Makes a Speech on Red Square from the 1960s by Vadim Odainik and Zoya Odainik Samoylenko. So it's husband and wife team, uh, very well known uh, Ukrainian Soviet artists and uh, that gave rise to a dynasty of artists. Their offspring, their children are still active as artists in Ukraine. And uh, so back to leaders and the masses. What is the concept as far as leadership? underlying these paintings. And as I mentioned, it's based on Marxism. And it says that the working masses, the people are the subject of history. They are the ones that make history. They are the driving force behind historical change. And leadership and leaders are good leaders only to the extent that they manage to capture the feeling uh, of the uh, that permeates the masses at any given historical moment and support their interests. And uh, so the driving force are the working masses and leaders become their political voice. So that's what leadership is according to official Soviet ideology. Of course, uh, we can look back and see that in reality, it was different and leadership sort of took over the voice of the working uh, classes of the working masses uh, in a one party system. So there was no other option than to vote for the communist party. So what kind of a voice then would a working mass have if there are so few options for them or none? Uh, and we see this concept reflected in in these paintings, but also we will see a lot more. So let's look at this painting. Lenin makes a speech on Red Square. Uh, we see the masses, the a group of people, they are foregrounded, they are closer to us. Lenin is smaller. So that tells us that this artist places the working masses up front. And um, uh, so how, uh, so this painting is um, showing the moment when Lenin makes, uh, was making a speech on Red Square on the anniversary, first anniversary of the October Revolution, which is November, was November 7, 1918. Uh, the title does not give that much of an explanation. So how do we know? Uh, it's the these red banners the slogans that ha, uh, they have tell us that this is the first anniversary of the october or of the bolshevik revolution that happened a year ago uh, looking at this painting a, a year before and uh, this is what soviet artists did they put a lot of clues and a lot of references a lot, and a lot of hints on how to read a painting, how to understand it. And they had to, uh, because the Soviet paintings were supposed to contain very clear and unambiguous messages that were clear to viewers. And uh, what is also was very important to censorship. 
um, and we will look through in all of the paintings that we are going to look at. Uh, so we know that this is the first October of the revolution. It's a historical moment. We know that Lenin did make a speech on Red Square on that day. And so look at the crowd of people. These are not just random people. The artist chose to show that the revolution was actually supported by a broad spectrum of the population and the population that mattered to the new Soviet government, which is the working people and the peasants. So we see here in this painting um, soldiers, soldiers uh, uh, drawn from, again, the working classes and the farmers, the peasants. A lot of soldiers. Uh, uh, you can look at their, see their hats. This, uh, this was the new uniform for that the Red Army uh, introduced in 1918, uh, the so-called Budyonovka hats. We will see a Budyonovka later. There is one actual hat that on display uh, in this exhibition. Uh, we also see workers, that's... Uh, kind of a typical working outfit. Peasants are represented by women. You see these women in colorful shawls and in the kind of peasant dress coats. Uh, we see sailors, revolutionary sailors. Uh, we can recognize them by stripy shirts. And there is another one here. Uh, we see some red ribbons on people. No, well, red ribbons uh, from 17, on through the civil war, they would uh, show that these were supporters of the revolution. We actually, see, we can see one more soldier in the Budyonovka hat. You see the red star on top of, of that hat. We see more women, even children. And we see a little bit of the educated classes or bureaucrats wearing these kinds of hats. So it's just the representative cross section of the population. Uh, we don't see the exploited, the exploiting classes that were being eliminated as Lenin spoke on Red Square. The priests, the industrialists, aristocrats, top officers of the Tsarist army, none of that here. And now let's look at some of the close-ups. So we see that again, I cut some uh, little close-ups from this painting. We see a soldier in the red army hat with this red star on top. This is a sailor. And this old worker in glasses is a, just a, the kind of an image that would represent to the Soviet viewer. And they knew how to read these paintings, uh, an industrial worker and also this person wearing this kind of hat. Uh, it seems like this painting gives us a good representation of people, but look at this ghostly image in the back. And uh, it's a church. It's kind of uh, covered with a little bit of smoke or the fog and um, This is the church that would be destroyed in 1936. So it's the ghost of a church. And at that time, Russia was a Russian Orthodox country with uh, most of the population being Russian Orthodox. So, uh, but there is no representation of those because the Soviet government persecuted uh, all kinds of religion. It was an atheist, anti-religious state and government and the ruling party. And we will see a lot of these ghosts in, uh, in these paintings that the artist, artist did not 
want to give voice to, but sometimes they even against themselves and or unaware of that introduced into their paintings. So this artist, this, the family of artists who created this painting wanted to be historically correct. That's why they had to put this uh, church in the background. It used to be on Red Square, built in 1625. In 1625, it was an ancient relic that uh, was still active in 19, uh, probably about to be closed in 1918. Uh, but in 1936, it would be destroyed. So the artist actually did not did not ever see that church. He had to uh, look at some old photographs or probably some old paintings. Actually, the church does not even quite look like the uh, church it used to be because the artist never saw it. He could not quite imagine, or he could probably, but he never saw it in that space on Red Square. It was gone in the 60s when this, uh, this painting was done. And uh, so that's what we are going also to look at in some of the paintings that we will be looking at in this exhibition the hidden voice, the silenced voices, the ghosts that Soviet artists chose not to show. And this is the photograph of the actual meeting. You see Lenin's podium really looks very remarkably so, and we still see the, the church in the background. You see the crowd looks a little bit different, right? So uh, there are a lot of military and the civil war was going on at that time. And not so many of the common folk that the artist chose to put into his painting. So what was Lenin talking about on Red Square? Probably he was voicing some of the, his famous slogans that won him the revolution which was um, peace to nations, land to peasants, and uh, factories to workers. And this painting that is actually next to Lenin's painting can be an illustration of his famous decree and slogan adopted early on in 1917, land to peasants. So, and this painting is called Land. What we see here is a family, a Ukrainian family, we can say so looking at their, what they wear, uh, standing on the edge of the field. And there are some people in the background. So what helps us to uncover this story in this painting? What are the clues? So first of all, let's see what kind of people they are, whose side they are on. So the main character here, the man has again the Budyonovka hat with the red star, which means he was in the red army. And in the other hand, he has a lump of soil, of dirt. Uh, in a way, this is the whole program of this painting. This uh, peasant fought in the red army in the civil war protecting the revolution, and now he is receiving a chunk of this large field, which was probably, and for sure, previously owned by a wealthy landlord. And we see another soldier here with a measuring stick. So he is going to cut this large field into a lot, lots and give each lot to each individual peasant. And we, again, we see that red ribbon uh, showing this guy as the supporter of the, I'm sorry, of the revolution. Uh, so you see Soviet artists wanted to be understood. They wanted to uh, show exactly what they meant. They wanted their message to be clear. That's why the artist places that red ribbon. It seems unnecessary uh, here but he places that red ribbon on the chest of, of that peasant. 
So we see the hopeful face of a woman. These peasant prob peasants probably never had their own land. We see some more people in the background uh, waving a red banner. So these are more peasants that would get uh, land. And there is a group of people behind the woman's shoulder. Let's look at some close-ups. So this is the red, uh, the red army Budionovka had. Uh, a piece of soil in man's hand. Uh, this is the measuring stick. But look at these people. They seem to be conspiring. They're not quite participating in that, uh, in that group that is showing their support of the revolution and what was going on, um, raising this red banner over their heads. So these are probably the people who are wealthier peasants who don't want uh, to share their land, who don't want to share their resources. And they are conspiring or they are discussing what's going on, seemingly not quite pleased and probably even angry. Look at the red face of that man. We will see more of that in some other paintings. So what are, what is the artist not trying to say here in this painting? Uh, he's not saying that this land very soon will be collectivized. And this guy who has so much hope on becoming the owner of his land and it's so important for a peasant to actually own the land that he cultivates and to take good care of it. Very soon this land will be collectivized and he will become a collective farmer, a hired person who would work for, uh, for the state. So I would like you to show this Budionovka hat. Oh, it's on display uh, in the museum. It's a reproduction. Uh, and but still it represents well the hat that we will see more of in many of these paintings. Uh, yeah, so the land will be taken away from these peasants and this painting next to land actually shows us that moment when uh, communists would be sent to villages uh, across the country, across the Soviet, Soviet Russia, around 1928-1929, and would be setting up collective farms. It also shows the resistance that was given to the collectivization by, uh, by the kulaks, uh, by wealthy peasants who did not want to give everything away and collectivization, especially on the early stages, meant literally taking everything away from a peasant, including his livestock, his uh, seed grain, uh, sometimes even their, their furniture, which all their dishes that would be uh, potentially shared by uh, collective farmers during their lunch breaks. This story is very, uh, it just saddens my heart to look at this because I come from the family of Northern farmers. My mother was born um, into a family of a Vologda region farmer and he had, uh, he had a fam my grandfather had a family of eight children he had to flee the collectivization in 1928, actually, when my mom was born. Uh, he left everything behind, but he so did not want to become a collective farmer that he put his family into a couple of carts, all of his multiple children, and he went to Siberia himself instead of being probably forced to exile, uh, to go there into a labor camp or into an exile place uh, if he stayed. Yeah, that was really a tragic, tragic moment for, uh, for Russian peasants, the 
8, 29, 19, 30. The complete universal collectivization. And that's what the newspaper that you see sticking out of this young man's pocket is talking about. So this is most likely the uh, article that was published in 1929 in the Pravda newspaper and it was authored by Stalin and it was called the year of great change. And that marked the beginning of the total universal collectivization of farmland. And so we remember Lenin's slogan that we just discussed, land to peasants. So it did not quite happen. The party, uh, the Communist Party sent about 25,000 communist workers into villages to help collectivize uh, the land. And this is the moment that we see this young man is uh, uh, wears this more urban outfit, uh, a worker, that, a communist worker that was sent by the party to collectivize. And these people on the left are the wealthy peasants or the kulaks. You see the gun in one uh, uh, that one of them is having and pointing at the, at the young worker, young communist. And our young communist, the only weapon that he has is the words of the party, which shows that, of course, the painting represents collectivization in a very positive way. And how do we know that? So look at this plant, uh, thistle. We know it's, uh, it grows here uh, in Minnesota. In Russian, it is called chertopaloh, which means devil's scare. So devil's plant. So now we know whose side this artist is on. Uh, and we see some little beautiful blue flowers, more benign plants on the side of the young communist. We see the red, new red dawn behind him and the darkness and this devil's scare or devil's threat plant right in front of them. So this is how uh, Soviet artists created these compositions and planted visual clues for the Soviet viewer to be able to understand the painting correctly. And of course, everyone knew the history uh, behind, behind this. An altogether remarkable painting. Okay, let's go back. So this is where the painting is in our exhibition. And um, next to this uh, painting that depicts the collectivization, uh, we see the large portrait of Karl Marx. So talking about the leaders, Karl Marx needs to be mentioned. And Karl Marx uh, was considered to be the founder of uh, the ideology, which was called Marxism-Leninism. That was the main teaching that Soviet ideology was based on. And those people uh, among you guys who are familiar with Russian and Soviet history and probably visited the Soviet Union are well familiar with the slogan, forward uh, to the victory of communism under the banner of Marxism-Leninism. And uh, Marx uh, here is a towering figure. He's in London. So we see Marx in London. Uh, Marx went to London in uh, 18, around 1849. And it was there working in the British uh, Library that he composed some of the most important works that would later become the foundation of uh, the Lenin's uh, teaching, uh, Das Kapital. 
capital. And we see here behind him uh, some of London's highlights, probably St. Paul Cathedral, the buildings uh, of the Parliament Tower and Westminster Abbey. And my guess that probably the artists have never been to London because these are very schematic. They are hardly recognizable. I just was, uh, I, I know London well, so these, uh, this is not how St. Paul is supposed to look. So they're very, very basically painted. But, you know, in the Soviet times, it was really hard to travel outside the country. You had to be a communist, most likely. And uh, so I believe this idea is probably didn't go to London to paint this landscape and just relied on some, some uh, pictures and photographs. Uh, so Karl Marx was supposed to be heavily studied by uh, the Soviets, but in fact, uh, his books were only read as a primary source in colleges and the working masses just knew about him from history lessons at school, middle school and high school. So Marx was a highly mythologized figure, in fact. And people knew he was the founder of Marxism, Leninism, but how it worked exactly, not a lot of people uh, other than those who went to college, especially the humanities. And I had to study Marx at the Leningrad University, of course, and had to, read some of his works, but mostly given the, the official interpretation of what Marx was saying. And um, so he was, uh, a in, in a way, a mythological legendary figure. And I would like to give you a quote, just to understand what's behind this portrait, from Lunacharsky, who uh, inaugurated a monument to Marx on the same day as Lenin was speaking on Red Square that we just saw the painting of. So Mark uh, Lunacharsky, who was the Commissar for Enlightenment in the early Soviet government said that Karl Marx is the leader who even though he is long dead, but from his grave, he points uh, uh, our give us the direction forward with his immortal voice. He invisibly guides us. He is like a protective uh, guardian spirit hovering over Lenin's head. And he whispers uh, he, uh, the wise prophetic words into his ear that Lenin then takes and guided by those words. He uh, leads us to new victories, the victory of the world revolution. And look at this painting. So Marx, uh, you see the portrait of Karl Marx. He is literally hovering over Lenin's head. We don't see him whispering uh, his prophetic words, but he is definitely there. Uh, so, and this is another clue, another hint that this artist put into this painting of Lenin speaking at the Third Congress of Com Komsomol to help us understand this painting, to help us read it in the correct way. And of course, there are uh, some other things. You can see these eager faces of uh, the listeners uh, we can uh, see again the same cross-section of the population. We see Red Army soldiers uh, and uh, also sailors, revolutionary sailors. And here is one more. We see women, we see the working youth. And uh, why are they so enraptured? in Lenin's word. Why do they listen so, are they listening so eagerly? Well, the third Congress of the Komsomol was famous for Lenin saying something that was not expected by the youth that came to attend the Congress. And I read memoirs about the third, this very particular event. 
and one of these people present uh, was writing that um, the uh, the audience was very excited to learn that Lenin would be present at this Congress. And they thought that Lenin would inspire them to fight for the revolution. They were eager for more exploits and adventures and heroism. And what Lenin said, uh, he said uh, to them, and probably these are the words that he is saying as we look at this painting. Uh, he said that, you young people of the Soviet country, you need to know and do three things that are the most important at this moment. And they will be study, study, and study. So these are the famous words that probably every school child in the Soviet Union knew. And uh, probably that's what the artists knew about this Congress. And that's what uh, we see Lenin saying to, to the young people here. And uh, how about another slogan that Lenin pronounced? Uh, Peace to nations in, 1917. Well, uh, before we know it, the country is plunged into a bloody civil war so much for peace. And this painting here shows this um, civil war in Ukraine. This painting to your right, so uh, I'm combining in my presentation gallery shots and close-ups of paintings. So this painting uh, actually brings us again to Lenin's words, Lenin's leadership and his uh, famous decree and uh, slogan, peace to nations. And that's what this newspaper is about. We know what newspaper uh, this is. It's Izvestia, um, the Izvestia newspaper of uh, 1917, um, end of October, I believe October uh, 29, 1917, the Izvestian newspaper. That's when where this decree on peace was published. So you see like that newspaper in the pocket of the young communists who collectivized farmland in Ukraine, we know exactly what these newspapers are. So Soviet artists tended to be very precise. They did st study the historical background of what they wanted to depict because these paintings would be submitted to a jury if they wanted to participate in a public exhibition. And all of these paintings, they don't look like an artist would paint, paint this for himself or to decorate a, pub, uh, a private home. They were all intended for public display. And so they would be uh, scrutiny, scrutiny, they would be under scrutiny to see if the artist was indeed uh, adhering to the Soviet version of the Soviet history and to all the tenets of socialist realist style. Uh, so the first decree on peace, we see a group of soldiers here, still uh, that's 1917, the revolution is three days old. This is still the Imperial Army and we see the Imper Imperial Army uniforms. And um, we see that's a sailor uh, who, sailors were active participants of the revolution. While these people here, most likely in, very, in a very short time, they would be split into the white army and the red army and begin to kill each other. That's why there is this apprehension on these uh, soldiers' faces. This guy is apparently quite uh, happy and he looks like probably, because he's holding this newspaper, he looks like one of the uh, agitators that were a lot of in the Tsarist army trying to gain support uh, for the Bolshevik party, for Lenin's party within the Imperial Army. And look at these slogans. They say, 
uh, down with the war, peace to nations. So it seems like uh, these, what the artist is trying to tell us here that indeed the Bolshevik revolution of 1917 had broad support within the Imperial Tsarist army. And we see some very threatening armored trains uh, behind uh, that probably symbolized the, the war and how dangerous and threatening and scary uh, these killing machines could be. And here we have this uh, slogan, peace to nations. And of course, one of the silences that the artist would not be talking about that the civil war brought a lot of devastation to the country, carried away uh, many, many lives and uh, divided the country. And this is uh, one civil war painting that we have here. And again, we see red banners here. So this is the red army fighting for the revolution. We again see these Budyonovka hats. I counted probably about 10 Budyonovka hats in our exhibition. Probably I'm wrong. So if you visit the museum, please help me count them. So it's like a scavenger hunt. There is one here and one here. Uh, it shows again the, even though it's called a partisan raid, and, uh, but we see the intent of the artist is to show broad support of the revolution. There are some Cossacks, this guy is wearing a Cossack uniform. Also, we know that Cossacks were, uh, the overwhelming majority of Cossack armies were on the side of the Imperial Tsarist army, but we see some Cossacks here, and we see just some peasant, kind of attires and we see red army soldiers and of course the leader here is on white horse and um, a hero on white horse bringing salvation bringing uh, safety and salvation to people it's a popular mythological representation of a white horse as that given to the hero who brings freedom or any other kind of good things to, to the people. Now, uh, we are still looking at the leaders. On the upper floor of the exhibition, there will be a lot of large paintings uh, representing the masses, but here on this floor, uh, we see a lot of paintings focusing on Soviet leaders. And this painting is of Lenin and Shushanskoya. Uh, we are planning to have this as a standing event probably once a month. I will be talking more about this exhibition. And this exhibition is so wonderfully deep. Uh, it has such a depth of historical and artistic uh, content and materials that it would be a shame to try and cover it in just one tour. And um, that's why we will talk more about these paintings. They're truly fascinating historically and how these artists represented uh, the Soviet history. So more Lenin, Lenin in Shushanskoye village, 1985. And a Soviet viewer just looking at the title of the painting would know what it means, Lenin in Shushanskoye. Uh, because we studied, if Marx was studied in colleges and universities, the uh, life of Lenin was studied in elementary school, in middle school, and in high school. And we all knew that uh, Lenin was exiled to Shushanskoye around 1895-96. Few people would remember the date, but of course they would know that before the revolution, uh, Lenin was exiled to Shushanskoye. That would show him as a, a sort of a martyr. So he was not just the leader who took over power in 1917. He actually worked hard to gain trust of the people and to earn the support. And he 
had to go through some hard times to be able to really understand the revolutionary situation in Russia. But also from some other memoirs and even from Lenin's own words and letters, we know that uh, Lenin's exile in, Shushin, in Shushinskoy was actually quite nice. He had a good time there, unlike the exiles that uh, some of the Soviet people who would be uh, labeled as enemies of the people would have to go through under Stalin's time. So unlike exiles and labor camps that would be installed by Lenin's supporters and his followers uh, in the country that was largely established by Lenin, he himself under the czarist regime that he claimed was so bad had a good time in that uh, Siberian village of Shushinskoya. In one of the letters he even wrote, uh, so life here is not too bad, I even gained weight. Uh, so Lenin uh, spent uh, about a year, probably over a year in that Siberian village. He was supported by his mother, so he had money. Uh, he went hunting, he went for long walks. Uh, he had enough space uh, in his house to work. He brought a library with him and he wrote a lot of important articles and uh, works on the political situation of Russia in Shushinskoye. He even got married in Shushinskoye. His uh, fiance, Nadezhda Krupskaya, uh, joined him in uh, in that Siberian village. And you can see the church probably reminding us of the fact that Lenin was married in church in the Shushinsk in, in that Shushinskoye village of Shushinskoye. So how is Lenin represented here? It's a somewhat later painting, 1985, already Gorbachev's times, shortly before Perestroika, just six years before the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the artist Grigory Bonia here allows himself to be slightly more imaginative. And here Lenin is represented almost uh, like the, um, the uh, mist or the master of the universe. Look at this, uh, the, um, uh, the colors behind his back. It's almost like the world energy is rotating and whirling around him and pushing him forward to us. And uh, he is a towering figure over the Siberian landscape and the tiny village, tiny houses that we can see here in top uh, bottom right corner of the painting. It's an altogether fascinating painting, again, showing how these political leaders were quite often mythologized in, in Soviet art. And uh, now let's look at the highlight of this exhibition. I just have a little bit more time, but we will continue next month. Uh, to talk about uh, this large painting, uh, which is uh, 9 by 14 feet. It's the, probably the largest Soviet era painting in this country. It's enormous. And uh, it represents, um, so let's go back, it represents uh, Tallinn's anniversary, his 70th birth, birthday, celebrated in the Bolshoi Theater. This painting, according to our collector, Yuri Manichuk, uh, was uh, given to him by the widow of the artist, Shovkunenko. The painting was done to be submitted for the Stalin Prize in 1950. It never got the prize uh, because, uh, again, according to the widow of the artist, Stalin was shown too small in this painting. So some other paintings where Stalin was bigger in size probably 
won the prize. So the painting had to go back to Ukraine, back to the artist, and probably it was shown uh, uh, for a short period of time. But remember, already in 1953, Stalin was dead, and Khrushchev, whom we see here on display, right here, Nikita Khrushchev, would destalinize the country. So the painting was rolled on a tube, on a huge tube, and was kept in the artist studio until uh, Yuri Manichuk bought the painting for his collection. Then it was sent to Italy, then it went to Canada, then to the United States, or uh, again rolled on a huge tube. And then it arrived in our museum. And in our museum, we stretched it and we suspended it from the mezzanine level. And I would like to end my presentation here showing you a short video. We will talk about this painting because it's just 10 minutes, probably will take me 10 minutes to talk about this painting alone. Um, uh, I would like to show you this short video that shows our installation team and you will see how this painting was installed in our museum uh, this summer actually in june and after that i will be able uh, uh, i will be happy and ready to take your questions <laughs> The ropes should be helping us. Hold on the ropes, please. Hang on. Thank you. 